Hello, and welcome again to the Gary DeMar Show. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Joel McDermott. I'm here with the second segment with a uh, professor of apologetics and systematic theology of Westminster Seminary, uh, Professor Scott Holofant. Uh, Scott, uh, we were just talking about your republication, your edition of Cornelius Van Til's Defense of the Faith, and we kind of talked about Van Til a little bit and his contribution to the faith. Right. Now, one of the things we said was that his early critics uh, badly misrepresented his views. Yeah. And you said that kind of still goes on today, unfortunately. Could you, yeah. could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, um, I guess one of the most obvious uh, examples would be the uh, critique that came from the Ligonier folk a number of uh, years ago, a couple decades ago, I guess. Um, not, not that um, criticism in and of itself is bad. Uh, we, we always want that to see if there's some things we can make clearer. But um, I think the problem in, in a book like that is that it's so misunderstood Van Til and misrepresented Van Til. Um, I mean, it's, you know, you, you hate to say it about people that you respect, but um, you just wonder if they had, if they had read Van Til uh, in, in, the, in the critique. And um, I, I think as, um, as scholars, we are owed um, uh, under God, and certainly with regard to our reading public, we owe them the honesty of um, building the thing that we're critiquing in the best possible light, and then, if we need to, critique it um, so that we don't have a straw man there that we're trying to knock down. It's too easy to knock that down, and that's, that's really what happened in classical apologetics, I'm afraid. It was, uh, there are a lot of straw man arguments there that just, just don't resonate with what Van Til's trying to say. So, so this, this word, this label, it really gets attached to Van Til's methodology is presuppositional. Right. And, and I read an old article years ago the other day where you said, uh, as, as early as 10 years ago, that this is, a, this is a dead label. We need to get rid of it and replace it with something else. Right. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that, and I, hadn't, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before myself, but it really was common sense. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, all, all I'm trying to say there, um, well, for, first of all, I think it's important to see that Van Til didn't give himself that label. It was, uh, it was first in print, uh, to my knowledge, in the late 40s. Uh, Oliver, uh, J. Oliver Buswell was, uh, was critiquing Van Til and called him a presuppositionalist, and, and uh, the term kind of stuck, and so Van Til kept it. Part of the problem with that now, though, when we're into the 21st century, is that uh, particularly after uh, Thomas Kuhn and after um, postmodernism is made some inroads, everybody's talking about presuppositions. And um, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times, that people think what presuppositionalism is, is we just have to say everybody has presuppositions, or we have to say we're aware of our presuppositions, and that is not what Van Til was trying to say. That's the first problem. Um, everybody's talking about them, so it, it becomes kind of diffuse. Um, I remember talking to a, uh, a well-known apologist a number of years, this was probably 25 years ago, and um, in the course of the conversation, he said, oh, well, I guess you're a presuppositionalist. And I said, yes. And he said, well, are you Carnelian, Schaeferian, uh, Clarkian, Vantillian? And that just sort of tipped me off as well, that um, the label itself is not very helpful. The, the other side of that is um, because I'm convinced that one of the emphases um, that needs to be uh, given in Van Til's work is that everything he did and said was built on the foundation of Reformed theology, I thought it better uh, to provide a label that would highlight that theology and highlight some of the primary tenets of Van Til's position. So I think, um, in my own view, co covenantal is a better way to think about that. That is, that um, the creator-creature distinction uh, has to do also with the creator-creature relationship that God himself has uh, sovereignly initiated, and um, that really is the covenant. Um, so <clears throat> when I teach it, um, I teach it as covenantal apologetics, uh, partly because I, I do want to uh, make sure people understand this is not strictly a philosophical discipline. It can be that, and in, in uh, some ways should be that, and I've written some things on that as well, but apologetics is for the church, and not everyone in the church is a philosopher, and so we need to put it in churchly language so that people understand, not, number one, what it is and why it's important. And that yeah. brings me to the issue of how how, in Van Til's mind, how closely apologetics was linked to theology. Right. And they had to come in a particular order. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think here, um, as I was saying in the first segment, here's where you see Warfield's influence on Van Til. You see Bobbing and Kuiper all over the place. But um, one of the things that Warfield wanted to highlight in his disagreements uh, with Kuiper on apologetics was that um, apologetics had to be 
in one sense, kind of the gatekeeper. Um, it, in Warfield's words, you have, you have to talk about truth before you can get to some of these other issues. And um, the, the reality for Van Til was that it, once you have a Reformed theology, if you're going to defend the Christian faith, what you're defending is the Reformed faith, and so you can never at any point leave the tenets of that Reformed faith in order to defend that very faith. And, and, and what he was seeing was time and again, this is what people were doing. They were pretending to jump on some neutral territory, neutral terrain, in order then to hopefully coax someone back to a reform context, but once you've jumped off the bridge, there's no way to jump back up to it. Um, so you, you have to stay on your reformed foundation and defend the faith according to that foundation, and all of the tenets uh, of reformed theology then come into play, specifically um, in reformed th theology, the two uh, principia that are so foundational to everything that we believe, that is, first of all, the absolute authority of the Word of God, and uh, the doctrine of God as we understand it in a Reformed context. Those two principia can never be sacrificed for the sake of some kind of pretended neutral discussion. Absolutely. Well, along those lines, one of the things I think you've written, published most recently, was a chapter in, in a book edited by uh, Gary DeMar's pastor, actually, David Hall, and Peter Lilbach, who's the president at your seminary, uh -huh. uh, Theological Guide to Calvin's Institutes. And you have the chapter that covers the very first uh, opening chapters of Calvin's Institutes. Um, and let me, if I said, take a couple seconds here and read from that and, and kind of springboard off of Calvin's thought. Calvin says in, the, I believe it's the, the first, first book, first chapter and second section, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. Our knowledge should serve first to teach us fear and reverence. Secondly, with it as our guide and teacher, we should learn to seek every good from him. Since there men, one and all, perceive that there is a God and that he is their maker, they are condemned by their own testimony because they have failed to honor him and to consecrate their lives to his will. That's Calvin's teaching on the doctrine of the knowledge of God and the knowledge of man. Yeah. And how does that that in particular, how does that influence Dr. Van Til's uh, apologetic? Yeah, well, it's just so uh, central and crucial to er everything that he says. And, of course, um, uh, Calvin, uh, obviously, is just echoing, as I, uh, as I say in the beginning of that article, um, Cal Calvin is echoing the Apostle Paul. The whole structure of the Institutes there in the beginning is is uh, taken from the structure of the book of Romans. So what he's doing um, uh, initially is he's, he's wanting everyone to understand in the Institutes that all people know God. That is, not simply that they know some abstract proposition that there is a God, but they know the God who exists. They know the God of the Bible. It's not a saving knowledge, but it is a knowledge that God gets in it's a it's a uh, what the what the reformed used to call an implanted knowledge god plants that in everyone so that they get it by way of god's own creation which includes everything that is we get it internally because we're god's creation and we get it externally because everything outside of us is god's creation yeah. knowing god then what do we do with that well as paul says in romans 1 after genesis 3 what we do is we suppress that knowledge in unrighteousness and in that suppression, then, what we want to do is uh, swap out another god. We want to have an idol rather than the true god. And so what Calvin is getting at there is that we, are, we condemn ourselves because we do know God, and yet in knowing him, we will not acknowledge him as God. And therefore, when we don't do that, we can't really know ourselves truly. And this is the point that Van Til makes time and time again. To what do we appeal in the apologetic discussion? In many um, methodologies of apologetics, because it is based on an Arminian theology, there's a supposition that our reasoning faculty is a neutral kind of faculty. And there's even that supposition in some reform quarters, unfortunately, which is not consistent with our theology. But in, in what Van Til was saying is there can't be any neutral territory, because every, everyone is either for or against. The antithesis holds across the spectrum of humanity. Um, so what then do we appeal? We appeal to that knowledge of God, what Calvin called the sensus divinitatis, the sense of divinity that everyone has within them. And when we appeal to that, then what are we appealing to? We're appealing to the very thing that people know to be the case, yet refuse to acknowledge. 
And uh, that then becomes the foundation for our apologetic methodology. We don't need a neutral territory. What we need is a true knowledge that people have, even if they won't say that they have that knowledge because of the power of sin. Good. All right, well, when we return in our third segment, we'll talk about some applications of that uh, specific methodology. And uh, 